travel and change is a man you know For better or worse, who could say? But when I die, don't you tell them I went out this way Here again with my good buddy Tyler. I wanted to just go ahead and get into it. Uh, we all know why we're here. We're talking about traveling. How is it that you initially went to Czech Republic? Because I think that was that your first um, major jumping off point. Was it Prague? We talked about the, the initial bug, the initial travel bug. But Ch Czech Republic was not my first experience. My first experience abroad would have been in Italy. But I would want, I guess before I get too far into it, what, where are you headed with it? What do you want to know? I remember when I first met you, I think you told me a story about being in Prague and you were drawing something on a piece of like a, a cool little artwork and mm -hmm. I think you were at a cafe. Oh, okay. And somebody looked at what your drawing was and was admiring your, your drawing. Yeah. And... Well, how did that lead you to go into the... Okay, business? gotcha. So, I've always been an artist and um, love love drawing. And, 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 and we talked about Joseph Campbell before. And one of the things that Joseph Campbell says quite clearly is follow your bliss. Follow, the, follow your bliss. Follow the things that you love and it will lead you to your treasure, basically. It will lead you to to who you are and... It'll, it'll open up doors and bring you the things that, that you dream of. And I was 19 years old or so, 18, 19, when I read that, and it really had a huge impact on me. And some of my own heroes were talking about Joseph Campbell. And uh, I went to art school, and I introduced the book to one of my close friends who also read it. And we started kind of like using that book as a preface to our lives and sort of like as a way of... of conducting ourselves in our lives we use the some of these philosophies and ideas to sort of lead our lives and direct our lives and one of those things was to go abroad and so of course I went to Italy and uh, came back and I finished art school and but those those philosophies never really left me during that period and I went back overseas and to sort of like, I may have already talked about this a bit, so I'm not going to get too far into it. But I ended up in Prague, and that is so. There's so many winding stories there, but I did end up in Prague. I I wanted to stay, and I didn't know how. I had already, I was a creative guy, and the year before, like this is this is no exaggeration. It is such a serendipitous thing. About a year before I was graduating from university, from art school, and I was sitting by myself in this apartment. I was all alone. My friend had left. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do in my life. And I was watching uh, on this computer that my mom bought me for my graduation gift. It was this old uh, Apple computer. And I had, <clears throat> had a DVD player on it, and I was watching the movie Brazil by Terry Gilliam, it was directed by Terry Gilliam. And the reason why I was watching is somebody had introduced it to me at this experimental television center I went to. And they said, have you ever seen Brazil? You gotta see it, it's like got all this claustrophobia to it, da da da. So I went and rented it, watched it, and I'm watching the uh, the director's commentary. And, I'm, and I didn't know really who Terry Gilliam was at that time. I didn't know much about him. He was the lead animator from Monty Python. He did 12 Monkeys. He did Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. He was a pretty big, pretty big name uh, in the filmmaking world. And so I was watching Brazil and I, I listened to this guy talk. And I was like, this guy is so creative. He's such an interesting point of view. I thought it was so smart what he was doing with it. And I remember like saying to myself, I want to do that. I want to work with somebody like that. I want to work with that guy. I want to, how do I do that? How do I, man, I really just want to do that. Like, I want to make a movie like Brazil. I want to be involved in something like that. And I came from an art school background. I loved movies and I loved stories, but I, n I never knew how to break into it. I come from a small town with two stoplights in it. I didn't know. At that time, it was a different world as well. It was not, it was not easy to get into the film industry. And so 
I just didn't know what to do. I just knew that 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 guy really had an impact on me. That movie had an impact on me, and I knew that I wanted to think like that. I wanted to live my life, my creative life, like that. And so, anyway, I ended up in Prague, and a friend of mine. I was trying to like. I knew there was a big there was a film industry there, and I had heard that Terry Gilliam the same director had been there a couple years before because I met a guy and he said that he had been a tour guide for Terry. And I was hanging out with this British girl I had just met, became friends and she was, she was here. She was in Prague because she worked in the film industry. She had worked with uh, Bertolucci, which is a quite, quite famous, big name Italian director. And she, she had been around for a bit and she was telling me go up to this company called Still King and go up to Still King and tell David Minkowski that uh, that I, you know, I recommended you here and, and don't even like get a bus, like get them to come pick you up. She was, <laughs> she's a British girl. She was real, uh, she was real posh and, 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 um, had this sort of way about her. And I was like, no, I'm just going to take a bus up there. I'm not going to get them to come pick me up. And, uh, and so I ended up like trying to, uh, I ended up trying to get, uh, you know, try to get a meeting with, with them up at Still King, but it didn't work out. Now, a couple of a couple of months before, I was in Prague. I'd been in Prague for a bit, and I was in a cafe, and I was drawing in a sketchbook. I was a, in, in go back going back to the Joseph Campbell idea. I was following my bliss. I did what I loved. I was following my passion. I I, I loved art. I loved creativity. So I was just I loved traveling. So I was doing it. I was living it. And I was sitting in this cafe and I was drawing. I was looking at people drinking their coffees and trying to draw them. And that's what my friend and I used to do when we were traveling. And that's kind of like, that was our pastime. It was something to do back then. This was back before social media or anything like that, about before smartphones. And I'm sitting there drawing this sketchbook. And I, un, unknown to me, there's a guy right behind me watching me draw. And his name was Micah. And he's like, hey, man, I like these drawings. And I was like, what? I was like, looked at him. He's an American guy. And he said, I like these drawings. These are great. Do you want to come in and illustrate some for my magazine? I have a magazine here uh, that uh, that I just started. It's an English speaking magazine, and we you know we need to you know we need some artwork. And the name of the magazine was called the Prague Pill, and it was this local like zine. And I said sure, and I I came in and I started drawing, uh, the, doing these illustrations and whatnot. Um, by the way, that guy Micah, his family bought a house here in this town that we're recording in. Wow. Yeah, talk about serendipity. Um, so after uh, I had that talk with that girl, Vanessa, the, the British girl, she's like, go up to Steel King, da 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 and, and I had been starving, living, living, eating my fingernails to survive. I was an English teacher. I was doing anything to survive, uh, just taking any kind of jobs, little jobs I could. Um, right about that time, right after she told me to do that, uh, I got this phone call. And it was early in the morning, I remember, and on the other line was a guy, and he, he said his name, and he said, I got your number from Micah at the Prague Pill. Do you know who Terry Gilliam is? Mm-hmm. And I said, are you joking? I said, Terry Gilliam is one of my favorite directors. Of course I know who he is. And he said, uh, well, I'm glad you know because I've been doing interviews and nobody, not everybody knows who he is around here. And I said, you, I said, well, who, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, I was like, what, why are you calling me to ask me that question? Uh, you know, and he's like, well, I'm working on this movie with Terry. And we're about to get, about to kick off this, this production up here. And my supervisor, who's been working with him since Monty Python, wants to hire a local Czech. And I don't want to hire a local because I've been living in the Czech Republic for a decade. And I don't want to bring a Czech on because I'm... When I work with them, they go off, they disappear and go drink beer in the middle of the day, and we need we need stuff done. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm not gonna drink any beer, you know. I was like, I, I'm I'm so like like, dude, what are you talking about? I would love to work on this movie. Like like, what do I need to do? And he said, well, we'll do an interview with him, with you, and you got to come up here. And it all started because uh, I was drawing in a sketchbook. I was following my bliss. I was following my passion. I was traveling and doing artwork. I didn't know what the next day was going to be like. I had no idea what was going to happen. I I was living off a couple of thousand dollars. I didn't have a warm jacket because I had got it had gotten it had disappeared in Rome. I was roaming around Europe and I was running out of money. I was sleeping on floors. I mean, there's so many stories up to that point. But the important thing is, I was doing what I loved, and I had no. 
other plan. Mm -hmm. And so I, I ended up uh, going in and interviewing with that job and and you know, there's tons of stories around that, but I ended up going up there to Barandov Studios, which is a big, uh, big studio, it's a quite famous, world famous studio. It's where you know, lots of really big um, historical films were shot in Prague, and, and lots of historical directors actually came out of Prague. Milos Forman, mm -hmm. I think he shot some. Um, I think Amadeus was definitely shot in Prague, but some really big movies had been made in Barandov. And I was up at Barandov, and there was this old painting up on the wall as I was walking up. And it was these, and I thought it was like a new painting, but of these old like filmmakers. But no, it was this old painting of like early filmmakers that they had done decades and decades ago. So it was like this old style of what they were, how they actually made it. And on the way up there to the right was Still King Productions. It was the it was the production company that my friend Vanessa had just recommended me to, oh. and somehow this guy Jim got to me at the same time. It was so surreal. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and there's Terry over there in the corner doing a film test, screen test with his actors. I walked through the hallway. Um, I was in there surrounded by all this film history. And, you know, the, the lead actress was walking through the hallway and I was just in this sort of enchanted world. And um, the, the movie was The Brothers Grimm with, uh, with um, Matt Damon, Heath Ledger, uh, Monica Bellucci and directed by Terry Gilliam. And I went in, I did the interview, some funny stories there, which are, I'd say for another time, I uh, met the supervisor and before, I'll t go ahead and tell you, before I went in that interview, I was elated. I was walking around the block over and over again, anxious and excited. I wanted this job. You could not imagine how excited I was and how I wanted that, how much I wanted that job. And uh, I was so like, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know. I didn't even know what my job was. I didn't even know what they wanted me to do. I didn't. When they told me what it was, production assistant. I didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And um, I just knew that I knew. Like Micah had told Jim, the the coordinator, that I knew my way around the computer and I could draw really well. Mm -hmm. And I was a cool guy. I was a good, good good person. And and my and Jim had called Micah asking him to do the job. Hey man, do you want to work with Terry Gilliam? And Mike was like, I can't. I just started up this magazine, but I know this guy Tyler. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it happened. And so I went in and I, I, I did the interview and I, I went back home. And I think that day I sent Jim another email or something. And I just told him, I was like, I just want to do it, man. I just want to do it. And, um, and I was so sure that they weren't going to hire me because they looked at my resume and I didn't have anything on it, you know, and I ended up, I ended up getting the job and, and this is what's so cool like about it, looking back on it, a, a month or so later, uh, the or not even that long, I think a few weeks later, the uh, Bob Weinstein, um, the Weinsteins were producing it for Miramax, and Bob Weinstein was on his way over to Prague, and uh, Kent, the, the supervisor, needed to do a pre-visualization, which is like, it's like an animated version of what what the sh the shoot is going to be. They wanted to do a previs of um, of a scene, and they had storyboards, but but they didn't. Kent didn't want to put together a pre visualization team that quickly, so he said, "Hey Tyler, just take Daniele's storyboards and just put them in a timeline, you know, and we'll just show him what we got, and just do whatever you can to make it look cool." And I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Because I came from. About, I knew how to work After Effects. I knew how to work the software that would allow me to do a 2D animation in the style of Terry Gilliam did on Monty Python. And I was like, I'm just going to go all out because I loved that kind of stuff. So I would sit there and just do this stuff for 16 hours and not think twice about it. So I was so excited. I spent my entire week putting together these two pre-visualizations, taking my friend, the storyboard artist, Daniele's storyboards and cutting them up into pieces and, and taking arms and turning them into joints and doing all these like basically taking making puppet animation the way that Terry had animated Monty Python and I made these little previs animations out of his storyboards and and Kent and Jim nobody knew that I was going to do that they thought I was just going to put the storyboards next to each other and try to do some like something when I showed it to them they got so excited about it and Kent was like, oh my gosh, we got to show Terry. And so wow. he, so at that point I was this, I was a nobody. Like I was a nobody. Like, I, like, and I didn't know, I was 
dude, I was a fish out of water. Like, I mean, on one hand, I was a fish in water because I was surrounded by something that I intuitively got. And on the other hand, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about the filmmaking. I knew, like, I didn't even know what I was supposed to be doing. I just knew that I was a creative guy. And so they went and grabbed Terry and they brought Terry in. Uh, and I remember, like it was yesterday, he came in and... And I remember Kent was like, uh, you know, like show him your work. And I, and I had audio, and so I, I said to Terry, I held up the the headphones. I said, "Do you want to listen?" And I was like, "Do you want to have headphones?" And he wouldn't look at me. He just like he was like he just shook his head. He was just like he's like he didn't want to engage with me on a personal level. Mm-hmm. Um, but he but he was there to see it, mm-hmm. and so I just pushed play, you know, and. Um, and the whole time he was giggling, you know, like Terry has this <laughs> he has this like. <laughs> he has this like little funny laugh it's very distinct and he was sitting there I was sitting right next to him like it's close to me to you watching my animations with one of my heroes that a year before I had said I want to work with that guy wow. and he's watching it and, and um, he's just giggling along with it and like laughing at it and like he's like I'm you know he's just like and at the end like that was it and I was just I felt great you know they walked out and whatever and then I could tell that Everybody was stoked. Like my, my department, I was in visual effects department. My department was stoked. They were excited about what had just happened. And um, and then later, Terry was calling me by by my name, and he was saying, "Is Tyler gonna shoot that? Is Tyler gonna do that?" Like like he he remembered me, and and I felt so honored. Like I felt so like I felt like in that moment, my life changed. In that short little period, my life changed. And I remember he was. Um, he he was he would come into the he would come into the visual effects office to take a break from the shoot and he would just sit there and talk to us like he would sit there and talk to the producer or me or whoever was in there and I remember I had this drawing that I had done for Micah at the at the Prague Pill and it was called the Mole Men of Prague and it was this fantasy story about these people that lived under the city of Prague and I remember I put it up as my screensaver on purpose because I knew it would be something that Terry would like mm-hmm. and sure enough. He was sitting there and he was supposed to be having a, a visual effects meeting or something. He kept looking over at the drawing and he had this twinkle in his eye. He was like, like he wanted to know, like, what is that? <laughs> you know, yeah. What is that? What is that thing? Like, what is that? And he just kept looking at it. And I kept seeing his eye dart over. I was like, it was like a, almost like a, a, I've never said this out loud in public. It was almost like a, I, it was almost like a hidden language in some way. I felt like I had, I felt like I had connected with, a, a, a kindred spirit in a way like I felt like there was this creative door opened up for me that that never shut after it was opened it was yeah. like this is where I need to be yeah. these are the kind of people I need to be around and I need to find other people like him like because not everybody on the film was like that not everybody was in tune with that creative energy in the same way that sort of like yeah. autonomous creative energy and um so from there, you know, like I, that changed my life. And I, I, I mean, there's so many stories and I know I'm kind of just talking to myself. I mean, I'm, you're, it's just me talking, but there are so many stories from that period and so many life changing things that happened. So many exciting things that were happening around me and to me during that time. I was in my early twenties. I went, I went off with a backpack. I didn't know what was going to happen. I had my jacket taken from me. I had my video camera stolen. I went through all kinds of hell. I, I, like I slept on the floor. I got hired because I was drawing in a sketchbook. And then next thing I know, I'm standing right next to a hero that a year before I had said, I want to know how do I work with a guy like that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I feel like that's... Uh, I mean, it. it's these stories like this where... First, you have the inspiration, which was Joseph Campbell, mm-hmm. a hero with a thousand faces, or or the, the power the, of myth. The power yeah. of myth, yeah. right? It starts with that, and then it like the middle part is sort of like you saw Brazil, and you know, then it was like, well, that's what I want to do, and then because you were doing that in Prague, you were following your bliss. Yes. Then there's a direct lead into getting on this film with like a dream collaborator or a right. dream director that you really loved his work and that's it's funny that you say the serendipitous word but that's really what it is yeah it's like um i feel like i was on a beam 
I felt like there was a yeah. beam laid out for me and I was just walking down it. And like you said, it doesn't happen unless you follow your bliss. And, um, you know, going back to also stepping outside of your comfort zone, going to the, the other world or the world beyond your normal world. And that relates to Campbell as well, because if you are traveling, if you're following your bliss in the sense that I don't know why I want to go to Finland, mm. but I know I love Yari Litman. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's very <laughs> it goes similar. Back to the original one. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's actually. Yeah, a I don't point. know why, but I'm just going to do it, and it really happens when you're young so much. That's so true. You know? Yeah. And so anyway, but I just wanted to make make sure that that point was like crystal clear, like how following your bliss can lead to these amazing serendipitous yeah. moments yeah and on that note since you've already told that story that was a great introduction to what a amazing career you've had so far with the film stuff and what as well as traveling but i also wanted to harp on an idea you mentioned earlier today give a a, a, a rapper three words and see what they can do with yeah them. i'm gonna do that right now with you okay i'm gonna give you three words and I'm, I'm kind of leading into hopefully a story will come up. Okay. This, yeah. But, um, here's the three words. One of them is Matt Damon. Another is Russian girls. And another one is, I believe it's ping pong. Oh, truth be told, he's told me this story before, but the audience needs. Oh my gosh. Okay, um, I, I, it's so funny you say that. Um, I didn't know I had told you this story. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. I'm gonna, well, this podcast will probably never get too famous, so I, I, I don't wanna embarrass Mr. Matt Damon, but. Um, he's got buku money. He, he's all right, he's he'll all right. Okay. He, he'll be able to handle this, and, and, he may not, and he may not remember it the same way. We're not, we're not canceling anybody here. <laughs> I've got Heath Ledger Just, stories we're, too, we're, by the way. We're revealing more yeah, so, so aspects to a, a certain character, which is Matt Damon. Okay. So yeah. So first of all, I want to say Matt was awesome. Like he threw a birthday party and invited the entire city of Prague and paid for it. Like, uh, like he was. He's an interesting, nice, great guy. Like, I, like it's hard to be a celebrity, by the way. Like he he was really friendly. All of all of them were really friendly, um, and professional. And and I have nothing but respect for him. Um, but I, I, uh, there is a, there is a, a funny story that happened, uh, and this was mostly about Russian girls more than about Matt. It's just Matt, it was a great, it, it, it couldn't have been better because Matt is a famous, wealthy superstar in the United States. At least he was at that time, especially. Uh, so there's this place in Prague called Le Clan, and it's a, uh, notorious uh, after hours lounge with a hidden door uh, oh maybe I'm not supposed to say that to anybody that's never been that's thinking to go there there is no hidden secret door it's just a myth uh, but anyway there's a there's a part of, of this club where uh, under the right conditions you can find yourself in this sort of like hidden part of, of this building and you didn't even know it was there on um, this particular night, uh, I was downstairs, and um, there was, I think it was a pool. I think they were playing pool. Was it pool or ping pong? I can't remember. It may have been ping pong. <laughs> it, I think it, wow, I can't believe you remember that. I think it was ping pong, now that I think about it. Uh, they were playing ping pong, and, and th this little after hours place, that it had all these rooms, and some of it was, it eventually got turned into a dance club. It, it was kind of a lounge, it was kind of a private section of the club that you could only get to if you went through this door in the wall and the door was like it was hidden by it was a brick wall but if you push the brick wall it would open a door and you would walk down the stairs and it's a it's a it's a notorious club I, I don't know how much it's changed I don't know where it's at right now but people that have been there will talk about it like oh my god what is the name of that club you know like it's it's just one of those um it's one of those places where crazy things happen but anyway this particular night wasn't too crazy I was just downstairs and it was in the middle of the movie and there were these gorgeous, drop dead gorgeous Russian girls uh, sitting there. They were so tall that 
they were sitting down, but they were like up to my chest, you know, <laughs> like, like when I was standing there and they were stunning and they were sitting there smoking cigarettes and just watching Matt play ping pong with, um, somebody, the other guys. And I just remember, I remember it because it just really struck me. Matt was playing and he was smoking a cigarette and he came in, he put out his, and unfortunately we're not visual here. We're just an, it's just an audio recording. Um, but he put out his cigarette and these girls, everybody had been noticing these girls, but Matt put out his cigarette and he looked at them and he gave them this look. I just remember he just sort of like looked at them like, I'm Matt Damon. <laughs> you know? like, like, he just gave him this look like, like you would if you were a movie star. And, uh, and I wish I could, I wish the audience could see my visuals because it was amazing. These Russian girls, they were, I remember one of them was holding a cigarette between her, her fingers on her lips and she looked at him and he looked at her like, like, what do you think? Like, you know, <laughs> kind of like, I'm Matt Damon, Don't you know? You know uh, yeah, I, I'm a movie star. I've got millions of dollars. And I am. We happen to find each other at the same. Yeah, and we just happen to find each other, and maybe I'll talk to you. (laughs) And I just remember that Russian girl looked at him, and she goes like this, and she just looked away, like I, like you're nothing, (laughs) like you are nothing to me, and you will not, like, like you have no idea how much power I hold. Like it was like, uh, and I, I was, I just was like. What? <laughs> and I and it, it sounds. I mean, it, it, it looks. If I could give the visual on it, it, it would it would be I think more powerful. But it was so phenomenal, and it says less about Matt because Matt was cool. It, there's nothing about him really, and more about her and how Russian the that that level that that particular thing with not all Russian women are one way or another way, but there is a thing with Russian women. I, I um. I was at uh, my, my my sister and her a boyfriend at the time came to visit, and um, I have a friend. She's a sweet girl, Vicky. She's a she's a Russian girl, and 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 we were at a party, and I was introducing all my friends to my my sister and her her uh, boyfriend, and Vicky was there with this other beautiful uh, Russian girl, Tatiana, and I, they were just standing there, just drop dead beautiful women, but they're super cool. They were so so nice and. They were just good people, and I just went up to them. I said, "Just like, hey, this is my sister." Da 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 da. And I started talking to Vicky, and she's like dancing. She's got, a, you know, she's got a cigarette. And she's dee 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 dee. I was like, "What have you been up to?" She goes, "Oh, today is my birthday." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Oh, it's your birthday." I said, um, uh, "I said, oh, well, let me go buy a drink, you know." And I was like, "Oh, what do you want to drink?" She gave me her drink or whatever. And I went and got her the drink, and I came back, and I was like, "Yeah, I got, I got somebody, you know, it's her birthday. I'm gonna give her." A, Give her a gift, you know. I gave her the drink. I said, "So, um, so here's your birthday drink." She goes, "Oh, I said, thank you so much." And I said, uh, "Do you do you anything special for your birthday this year? Anything special this year?" She goes, "Oh yes." And she pointed up and she's like, "Yes, my boyfriend bought me this Maserati up there." <laughs> <laughs> she went back to dancing, and I was like, "Forget the drink, dude." <laughs> like she had literally gotten a Maserati for her birthday. Wow. Yeah, and so she, you know, the the story with Matt is like. Um, that, that I put those two in context because uh, there's there's Russian there's a Russian um, style that you can't compete with you know if if they have you know if they have the money and they have the power over there it, it's at a high level and yeah. they have a lot of control and it's it's a different world they do not care about American movie stars they, yeah, it's right. not that interesting to them yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think that's just a well. It's, that's a story that partially relates to the, the your movie career, which you know you you went on about how that initiated, and um, I wanted to ask you that I wanted to put those three together. <laughs> yeah, you set me up on that one. That was funny. I didn't even know you knew that story. I, but I just remember you telling me that story, and that also relates to sort of like um, what what it's like versus um, the perception of um, stars, for example, in America versus their perception yeah. abroad. Right, right. Or different ways of... Uh, I, I think that the, 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 the mood at the time in Prague was something that I think that the movie stars that came over really appreciated, which was they were not they were not worshipped. 
there was no paparazzi type sensationalized. Yeah, it wasn't sensationalized. It wasn't that they weren't worshiping. It was just right. I mean, it was just the right level of intrigue yeah. and excitement without it being uh, annoying. The, the, the I remember like all the people that were. It was such a cool time. That period was such a cool time and place, and the coolest people that you will ever meet in your life were all seemingly in Prague. And I just remember hanging out with different people. I remember one girl, my friend, uh, she told me that she didn't even know it was Matt Damon. She just was hanging out with him. And she said, I didn't even know who I was hanging out with. And then later I found out who he was. And I think that the actors appreciated that. I think that they felt really at ease there. That they didn't, that they, they, I don't think they would have felt back here. They, They were having fun. We were all having fun together. And nobody was really like and that's another thing about that's the good side about the post-soviet sort of societies they they didn't it wasn't about status at that time you could go to a club and you would see the most gorgeous woman in the world and other i mean other than this russian story uh you know in general you could hang out with people that that never asked you what do you do for a living you know, they didn't care because everybody was kind of, they grew up under on the same, everybody was on the same level under the Soviet Union. So, and, and you know what? There's so many attractive people there that they, you're not special just because you, you can make yourself look good. It, it, it was just, everybody was cool. Everybody was yeah. fun to hang out with. It didn't mean anything because you were talking to a girl. It didn't mean that they, that you're, you're trying to get them. It, it was like everybody was friendly, cool sexuality was was really uh, sort of like not really a, 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 a faux pas it wasn't a it wasn't a puritanical it was just sort of like yeah we're we're who cares like we're just having a good time and i think that the i think that the movie stars really picked up on the energy of prague i don't know if it's the same it definitely changed sometime soon after that because they joined the eu and it was starting to change at that time i, I saw just enough of the old way to get a sense of what it was like in the 90s uh, and I saw it change as well so I had a chance to I had a chance to experience the wild wild east and then it, it becoming more yuppified and more more western and I really and I think anybody that lived in Prague during those pe- that era and before they will they will tell you it was it was very, very special, and it is not. It's still a cool place, but you can't find what was so unique about it unless you really know where to find it now. And I'm not sure if it's even there. I think you have to really go on the outskirts of Prague or outskirts of the center to get to it. Yeah. Um, but the, the, that community, that th- that group, they're still there. Those expats that went over there in the '90s, they're still there. And if you meet them. Just sit down and talk to them because yeah. they have got stories. If they can still remember them, and they'll tell you, I don't remember the first twenty years I was here because it was so wild. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. That's what's special about. I guess there's sort of like a a obviously with communism falling in Eastern Europe and in, in Russia. Um, if you really want to look at the silver lining, because I think we can all agree that, um, at least something like communism is, it doesn't, doesn't really work and it wouldn't really ever work in America and it hasn't really worked. I mean, at least from my perspective, um, anywhere, I'm pretty sure it never worked. <laughs> it never worked. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it's sort of like there's a flip side where... All those people who lived under it, mm. um, there's sort of a, a specialness about their mentality. Yeah, having having experienced that, but then having tasting sort of the freedom. Yep, and it makes them. I think they appreciate. Yeah, the new their new living. Yeah, and they, you know, it, it's very hard to att- There's two sides to that, as there always is. If you, I mean, if you compare the Czechs to the Russians in their in in the fall of communism, it's very interesting how the Czechs 
they, they suddenly were free and they suddenly were very free and they suddenly acted like they thought it meant to be free. The Russians did the same thing, but, and I'm not saying all the Russians are like this. I'm just saying that the, the Russian version of capitalism is nothing like the American version of capitalism, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. The, you can get, you can get a, a, a cat put in your ass pretty quick. Just like there was an American businessman who went over there and he, he ended up dead. You know, he ended up dead because he tried to do things there the way that, that we did it back here. And he tried to use the same rules. Um, but the, the, the Russian rules, I mean, you have to understand that the Russians have, and this, is a, this would be a very interesting podcast, but since the Mongolian Empire fell, um, when we think of Russians, and this is, this is not coming from me, this is a book written, a Ukrainian guy told me about, and I'm not saying I believe it or don't, but there's evidence of it, that, that when the Mongolian Empire fell, the Russians didn't know uh, another way to rule their society. So they, they just adopted the, the Mongolian way, uh, the, the, the Khans. And the Khans were seen as like godheads. They were like basically a god. And if you wanted to talk to the, to the god, you could talk to him, but then you were a nobody after he talked to you. And that's the way it was put to me. And if you think about the Russian, the, the Russian rulers the, the, throughout Russian history, it's kind of a treated the same. It's tr treated in a very, very similar sort of style, which is Tsar means it's like a Caesar. And, um, and so, so if you look at the two, if you look at the two ways, if you look at the Russian way of dealing with the fall of, of, of the Soviet Union, well, then they just had to adopt. They, they adopted the, what they knew, you know? And so you had like mafia style capitalism, which is as pure as capitalism as you can get. It's like, yeah, I'm buying that. That's mine. Get out of my way. No, I, it's mine. No, it's mine. Boom. Somebody's dead. You know, like that kind of stuff was truly, it was literally happening. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not saying it's all, it was all like that. But during the, after the Soviet Union fell, Russia had a hard time adjusting right. to freedom. Whereas the Czechs, who were once ruled by the Russians, they suddenly were free. And so you had free love. You had like, like we can do whatever we want because this is what freedom is supposed to be about. Whereas they, they weren't conditioned to it in the same way that we were. It was like, like, well, we are free, but that doesn't mean you like, that doesn't mean you, you don't have morals. You know, I'm not saying the Czechs didn't have morals, but it was definitely, it's very interesting to look at how they interpreted their new freedom. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of hinting on something that could be talked about, you know, at a much longer amount of time. Yeah. So I think in order to, we need to cur curtail the, the, and get to the ending. Right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. But, um, it's an exciting conversation. Yeah. And we yeah. could probably go into it more in other ones, but, um, as for now, those are two great stories. Uh, thank you, my co-host. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And Thanks. That was a great question. Yeah. Uh, the kickoff. So, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we will see you next time uh, on the Traveling Podcast. Thank and, uh, Thanks for listening in. All right. Traveling changes a man you know. For better words, who can say? When I die, don't you tell him? I went out this way Tell him I said something Tell him I said something great Everything else you can tell him That's still